Are you trying to learn Duport Etude Number 9 for all state, all region, or just to improve your own cello skills? Then stay tuned. In this video, I'm going to give you some key tips to help you master this etude. Hi, my name is Liz from Cellomoji.com, and I give you tips and tools so that you can learn to master all of your cello music. So last week, I talked about Popper Number 22, which is the other etude this year for all state and all region. So if you want to learn more about Popper Etude Number 22, be sure to check up the link up above, and I'll also leave it down below after this video. Similar to that video, a lot of the information that I am giving you today will definitely be geared towards those of you who are doing the all state or all region audition. However, again, Duport is part of the standard cello repertoire. So if you are just looking to improve your cello skills and really up your technical abilities, then these etudes, whether it's Duport or Popper, are definitely great ones to learn and give a try. So first, let's dive into some of the basics. First off, make sure you check which edition of the Duport Etudes that you are using. Um, on the website of your state, or in this case in Texas, they have it on the TMEA site. Uh, they're very specific about which edition of the Duport Etudes they would like you to play off of. In this case, it looks like this, and it actually has the Shermer 5025840 is the edition that they want you to have. And to be honest, I actually have three different versions of the Duport A2s because you know the numbers didn't match up and I wanted to be sure that I had the correct edition so that information that I gave you was based off of that edition. If they're gonna take the time to really specify which edition they want you to buy I really encourage you to really look it up and double check and try to purchase it yourself. Now I know there are some of you who get your excerpts of the etudes from your orchestra teacher at school and if that is the case then you know that's fine use that but I would recommend that when it comes to these etudes, there are always etudes in these auditions every year, and um, there are definitely good purchases to have within your own cello library. So the Popper etudes are definitely standard rep, and then same with the Duport etudes. It's just nice to have your own book of the complete etude so that you can always have it just in case if they ask for another etude next year. Okay, so this etude is five pages long. So it is definitely a beast of an etude. You don't wanna wait till like two weeks before the audition to suddenly learn this. Um, it's just way too long. Now in the audition, are they gonna ask for all five pages of this etude? Probably not, but you can't start to guess on which part of the etude they're going to ask for. So it is definitely good practice to go ahead and learn the entire etude so that way when it does come to just only using a section of it, you'll be prepared either way. One thing that I have been finding when it comes to the all state, all region etudes is usually there's one etude that's pretty lyrical, a lot of long lines and long slurs and bows, and then there is one etude that emphasizes a lot with double stops. If that is the case this year as well, then this Duport Etude is definitely the Etude that's going to be centered around double stops. Now, I don't know if this is for sure a common thing that happens every year or not, but you know, as you're determining like sections to practice in the Duport, I would say don't avoid the sections with the double stops. I mean, more likely than not, they are going to ask a section that has double stops in it. Scales. The two scales that would be good for you to review is the G major and the E minor four octave scales. At this point in the game, if you're playing etudes like Popper and Duport, you really do want to become very comfortable with three octave and four octave scales. If you are not as comfortable up in thumb position, scales are the quickest way for you to become comfortable up high like that. So I highly recommend that you go ahead and learn and practice these two scales if you haven't already, and make sure you also include things like arpeggios and things like broken thirds. Because of these double stops in here, broken thirds are actually pretty helpful in terms of just identifying uh, notes that go together and how they will sound when they are together. Number your measures. Now for just the sanity of yourself and your private teacher if you're working with one, or just if you're just referring to things for yourself, make sure you put in measure numbers. They are just super helpful. Again, this etude is five pages long. You don't wanna be like rifling through pages and what if it went out of order and you're not totally sure. The measure numbers are gonna just help keep you organized 
organized. And if, say, things like errors appear on the page or your teacher is trying to reference a specific measure, it'll just be much easier to find if you already have measure numbers in there. TMEA or your state music association website will also list when there are errors in the additions or parts of the etudes. So in this case, they've already listed that measure 53 is a C natural and not a C sharp. So unless you want to just kind of guess where that is, measure numbers are definitely going to be super helpful. They're not going to say something like the fourth page and you know six lines down, three measures over. They're not going to refer to it that way, but they're only going to refer to things via the measure numbers. I definitely also keep an eye on your state's music association website because they will often update it if things come up along the way. And then closer to the audition date, they will actually start listening certain sections where they might actually ask for that specific section for the audition. So I'll leave the link to the TMEA for us here in Texas down below and also on the screen as you can see here as well. The metronome marking is quarter note in between 76 and 90. Now if they're going to take the time to tell you the metronome marking, you really want to incorporate metronome practice while you're practicing this etude. It is really important to kind of be within that range. Now does it matter if you're on the low end of the range or the high end of the range? To be honest, I'm not really sure if that really affects your score on that. But I would say if I was judging it, I would want to hear someone who's just playing an etude really beautifully with good sound and tone and be within that range of the metronome marking. Divide and conquer. Like I said, this etude is five pages long. You don't want to just sit down and just play all five pages all at once. You do want to start breaking up this etude into manageable chunks and set deadlines for where you would like to be with each of these chunks of music. Definitely make sure you are running through the entire etude but to sit down and say I'm gonna practice all five pages of these etudes just seems a little bit overwhelming so I know I've definitely broken up the etude into manageable chunks so that I can feel like I'm approaching it in a very uh, systematic and stress-free way pay attention to the fingerings that are in this etude now it is not a hard fast rule that you absolutely have to do the fingerings in here but I do find that some of the fingerings that are listed in here are definitely helpful when I'm trying to tackle harder patterns Passages. This is especially true if you see the words same POS. This is going to indicate that your hand is staying in the same position throughout that passage um, and it'll just again make some of the things a little bit easier. Sometimes our instincts to shift around may not always be the most efficient fingering so they actually include these words to remind you to stay in the same position. However, if you see the words POS and a Roman numeral, those are the ones that you can ignore. Now, I don't think it really helps you in terms of fingering wise. I mean, it, what it's doing is trying to indicate what position you should be in on the cello. But to be honest, if you are at this level and you're playing this kind of etude, you shouldn't need that definition of what position you're in. You should just be able to find those notes, play those notes, and move on. For most advanced cello music, Roman numerals are used to indicate what string you should be on and not what position you should be in. While fingerings can be a little bit varied based off of personal preference, bowings are a definite must. There can be no wiggle room or your own personal interpretation of the bowing. The title of this etude even says four different bowings. So clearly it is challenging you to pay attention to the bowings and look at the variety of different things this etude is asking you to do. For example, in measure 45, it's having you change bows on odd beats. Uh, measure 62, it has down bows and up bows with dots, whereas we might think it's all in the same direction, but they're not. Uh, measure 228, that area is working with slurs and double stops to combine, so that is definitely going to be a challenge as well. One of the things about your bow is just always be aware of where you are in the bow when you're using it on the string. It is very easy in this etude, I find, to get jammed, where you get kind of stuck in a certain area and you're like, oh, I'm running out of bow, or it's like an awkward bow change, and it's very easy to just produce a really not nice sound um, because your bow got stuck somewhere. So try to be aware of what you're doing with your bow and the bow distribution throughout this etude. One final thing about bowing to remember is Ultimately, it is actually more about intonations and rhythms than it is about the bow. Of course, we want to have everything all working together, but you could be doing the bowing great, 
but if it's all out of tune or it's making harsh like bad tones on the cello then no one's really going to care that you are actually doing the bowing it is far more important to always keep in mind the most important thing is to make the most beautiful sound that you can out of your cello when it comes to thumb position always try to think about the structure of your left hand in a very general basic term of thumb position you're forming a thumb position with your thumb and your ring finger which will help form an octave across two strings so ideally your thumb is resting across two strings and then your ring finger is on the top note of that octave and you're making this kind of nice arc with your hand um, you want to try to avoid doing the caterpillar action so it's like when you're shifting up in thumb position you don't want to try to do like this sort of intro and like one finger and then the rest of your hand follows, you wanna to try to move your hand as a unit. This will become especially true because you have all these double stops up there as well. I really caution when you're up there that you don't write in too many finger numbers. I know it's super tempting because thumb position may be relatively of a newer position than the lower stuff, but when you look at a piece of music, if there is just too much writing and your music is almost black with all of these indications, I find that if anything, it's just more confusing. So instead, just make sure you're really practicing your, your notes and your finger changes so that you don't necessarily need every note to have a finger number on it. However, the one thing is, if you're playing through the etude and you find that you keep missing the same note over and over again, say you're playing a sharp when it should be a natural, or you're playing a flat when it should be a natural, or something like that, then for sure I would definitely put a finger number on it to remind myself to not miss that note. That one small action of writing in the finger number and seeing that visual cue of that different number will help make sure that you don't keep missing that note. Okay, now let's move on to double stops, which is clear Clearly a big challenge in this etude. My one question for you is how do you guys practice double stops? Why don't you leave in the comments below your different approaches on how you practice double stops? How I practice double stops is I separate the lines. So first off, what I'm going to do is when I'm separating the lines, my left hand is still playing both notes, so it's still pushing two notes down, but my bow is only going to sound out one of those notes. So it's mainly concentrating on one line at a time and making sure that each one of those notes is in tune. So first I would take, say, the top line of a double stop passage, and I would really concentrate on getting my hand to do the approximate shape of the correct double stop, but really concentrating and making sure that top note is in tune. Then I would do the same passage again, again ghosting my fingers and putting my fingers down on all of the notes in the double stops, but I would only play the lower note of the double stop. Finally, then I would play top note, bottom note together, and I would play throughout that double stop passage that way. Yes, this can be a little bit tedious and time consuming, but for me, I find it's a super effective way of really drilling in my ear, okay, this is what it should sound like when it is in tune. Definitely, if you have a tuner, I would bust it out in this section here. Tuners are just so helpful to let you know what note you're playing and making sure you're playing in tune. So there's one section in this Duport Etude where I chose to kind of tweak the fingering a little bit, and that is in measure 211. So if I'm coming from the last double stop in 210, I'm on a three and a one, the C sharp and the E. <laughs> And then the following measure in 211, it has you do a 4-3 to 4-2, then a 2-1, and then back to a 4-2, 2-1, 4-3. And there is nothing wrong with that fingering at all. And in fact, if you are feeling comfortable with that, you can probably skip over this section. But for me, I find that I'm really comfortable and feeling way more secure when I'm changing the fingerings to a bunch of two ones and three ones. So in 211, I would do that first one as a 2-1. So, so if I was to start from the last chord of 210, here's the first one of 211, the D F sharp. And then F sharp A, so F sharp would be with three A with one. And then back to, again, 2-1, D and F sharp. F sharp A. And now the second to last chord of 211 is the E and the G, which I would switch to a three and a one. I know it's listed as a two and a one, but I would do three and one. 
And then the final chord I would actually keep, which is a 4-3, because then I'm right there for the following measure, which again will start with a 3-1. So then it will be 4-3. Here's the first one of 212. So I'll play that one more time. In 211, I would play 2 1, 3 1, 2 1, 3 1, 3 1, 4 3. And so this fingering, I would actually also do again at 241, which is at near the end of this etude, because it's the same exact notes and the same exact passage. And again, for me, this is just a personal choice. I am just more comfortable with two ones and three ones, so that's what I would switch it to. This Duport etude definitely has some sequences in this as well. Sequences are when you're doing a certain finger pattern and then you move a certain interval away, say like a whole step, and then you do that same finger pattern again. Now, it it may not be as often as say a popper etude, which that is definitely a key component of a popper etude, but it's definitely here in a Duport etude as well. And it's good to identify these things because then it will sort of uh, help lock in the finger pattern and you won't feel like you're struggling to figure out every single section. There are not many dynamics written in this etude, but what little you do see, please make sure that you're trying your best to make them as grandiose as you can. You really wanna make this sound more like a song and not like an exercise. So say the line is going up, do a crescendo. If the line is coming down, do a diminuendo. Try your best to be as musical as you can when you're playing this etude. It's just gonna make things a lot more interesting for yourself to work on as well as the listener. If you are wanting a more in-depth tutorial where I walk you through note by note, section by section throughout this entire etude, then I really encourage you to check out the link on your screen right now and I'll also put it in the description box below. This is going to be the complete Duport 9 tutorial where I am going to go over the entire etude note by note so that you can feel confident when you are learning this etude. Now this isn't only for those of you who are doing all state or all region. This is for anyone who is wanting to learn this etude. Um, I know that there's so many components and if I was to just go over this entire etude it would probably just take hours and hours. But here I'm putting it all into one mini course where you can replay videos as many times as you like in the privacy of your own home. It'll be like you're getting private one-on-one -on -one lessons with me as I walk you through this etude and how to play it. I'll give you some tips and tricks along the way in terms of how to make certain things a little bit easier. Um, I'll also give you some extra drills that will help your left hand feel a little more solid. And as some bonuses, there'll be some complete slow playthroughs of the etude as well as an accompaniment track for this etude. This is something that I've always wished I had when I was trying to learn etudes growing up. Um, it was really hard to just like have someone there next to me uh, making sure that I'm playing all the right notes. So this is definitely meant to be a little bit more of a practice tutor, I guess you can say a practice partner, someone that will be right there next to you while you're learning this etude. Maybe you just wanted to even hear, what does this section sound like? Um, I'm sure there are quite a few of you out there who might have just told your teacher, hey, can you just like play this so I know what it sounds like? Well, guess what? This course is gonna do that for you and you can play it as many times as you like until you feel confident as well. So definitely check out the link below and check out this little mini course here. I definitely have one up for the Popper Etude as well, so you can check them both out. And it would be great to have you in the little mini course, and I would love to help you learn these etudes. Let me know in the comments below if there are any questions about this etude that I have not answered in this video. I know that this etude is five pages long, so I couldn't possibly cover almost everything in this etude. But again, this course that I am offering will cover almost everything that you could possibly think of. Any questions that you might have, I'll definitely address them directly in there as well. But if you have any questions off the bat while you're looking at this etude, please leave them in the comments below. I'm here to help you guys to learn how to play the cello, so don't be afraid to ask any of the questions below. Check out the videos on the screen right now, including my last video that was working on the popper etude and some other videos that can help you along with your cello journey. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.